Hi, I'm Tim Kilduff and this is Business Matters. It's HKM show about people who do interesting things in Hopkinton. Uh, and we're fortunate to have today with us Kathy McLeod, the superintendent of schools, who, uh, let's be clear, does not live in Hopkinton, but I think has, uh, has one of the most inter interesting jobs in the community. So thanks for taking the time to spend, to spend with us. Thanks, Tim. It's my pleasure. Uh, we, we, you know, we want to, th I think it's important that we talk a little bit about uh, your background. Uh, I'm interested in when you first thought about uh, being a teacher or being involved in, uh, in, the, in schools. So uh, that, that's a really interesting question. And the reason I'm smiling is because I've wanted to be a teacher for as long as I can remember. I, I must have been six years old when um, I set up school with my dolls and uh, had a school room in the basement. My parents bought me a chalkboard. It's just, it's been something that has been, I've always known that that's what I wanted to do. Um, so, for, so for as long as I can remember. Do you, was it because of a, a particular teacher, do you think? No, cut, no, I hadn't even started school yet. Oh, of course, right. Yeah. No, um, I certainly have had teachers in my life who have inspired me, absolutely. Um, I've also had administrators in my life who have not only inspired me but encouraged me um, to kind of see something in me that I didn't really see in myself. That's been um, an opportunity for me all along. So when I look back, on the steps of my career, it's always been encouraged by mentors and people who kind of said, so Kathy, when are you going to do whatever the next step was going to be? Um, I think the only exception to that is when I first got into education, I actually took a turn um, and started off my career in schools as a school psychologist. Ah, so, but you okay. know, again, I'm going to go back to say that that was also influenced by somebody that was important to me in my life at the time. It was a university professor, and I was ready to go the education route, and he really encouraged me to study psychology. And it has really helped me in every job I've had after that, in every role, I'll, I'll say. Yeah, I'd rather say role than job, um, because it's not a job. Every role I've had in education has been influenced by that early training I had in psychology, whether I'm dealing with parents or students or adults. Um, that early training has really been a positive influence for me. So that's where I started off in education before I even became a teacher. So it, it, get, you, you, you go up in the high school, up into high school, and, <clears throat> and you start thinking about colleges and universities and where you want. Did, did someone sort of take you by the hand and say, and, and direct you in terms of the, the next level of education that you were going to undertake? Not in high school. No. In high school, I was kind of just knowing that I was going to go to college. And um, at the time, I was in Canada, so going through the Canadian system. and. Uh, knew that I wanted to study and thought that I was going to do a four-year degree and then go into education. So it was at, at that point that I started um, really getting interested in psychology and that was the point where the professor really said, you know, why don't you do this first? Where was, where was the undergraduate? That was work? at Mount Allison University in New Brunswick, Canada. And, and, and then where? And then I Because you don't become a superintendent with just an undergraduate degree, I would bet. No, no, I have a couple of undergraduate <laughs> uh, degrees, and I really? have three graduate degrees. What are the, what are the undergraduate? What, what did you so study? So one is, is a Bachelor of Arts yep. in Psychology and French, and then a Bachelor of Education, which interestingly enough, I didn't get until after a Master's in Psychology. So I did my Bachelor's degree, and then I went right into Psychology and had a Master's degree in development, Child Development. Um, and so began under working in that area and then went back to get a bachelor's of education when I decided that where I really was going to have an impact was in the classroom. And that's, that's what happened, Tim, is that I was working as a school psychologist um, and arriving in classrooms to work with teachers who were having difficulty with students but having not been a teacher. And I realized pretty quickly that I needed to understand what really was happening in the classrooms and what it really meant to be managing 20, 25 kids and also trying to meet the needs of students that were really struggling. And so that's a really 
interesting lens for me that I bring to my work here at this point every day. Yeah, I would, I would think so. Let's finish out the education piece. So mm -hmm. undergraduate degree, then where? So I did my master's at Guelph University, also in Ontario, then did my Bachelor of Education at Brock University, also in Ontario, um, and then my family moved to New Jersey. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I don't know how much you want to know about that, but that, I, I think what's interesting right now, Ooh. because it, it, it speaks to a motivation, is that at that point I had been working as a first grade teacher, moved to New Jersey, was not certified to teach in New Jersey yet, um, and picked up a part-time teaching job teaching music. And I don't have music certification, it's a hobby. So I said, oh, I'll do that. And they needed a sub. And, but I also had to teach off of a cart because there was no classroom. So I understand what that feels like as well, um, to go to 30 classrooms with my little music cart. But that's how I got my foot in the door to teach in New Jersey, um, by just showing up and getting to know people and being willing to take things on. Uh, and then I recertified, taught first grade in New Jersey, and that was where um, my, my principal actually said to me, uh, what, why aren't you, when are you going to become a principal? And I said, oh, never. I said, I love what I'm doing, and I, I, um, I really don't have any interest. And she said, do me a favor. She said, I'd like you to take one course. Go sign up for one course in administration, and then come back and tell me that you don't belong in that room. And those are the kinds of things that have just, right, you know, yeah. and that's when I said somebody's seeing something in me that I didn't necessarily see in myself. Um, so I went, I took a course, and I was hooked. I was excited. I thought, oh, this is an opportunity to have an influence beyond my own classroom, to have potentially an influence on a whole building of learners. Um, so then I did a Master's of Education in Leadership um, at the College of New Jersey and began my administrative journey as a special education supervisor in, in Bridgewater, New Jersey. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then where? <laughs> this is an interesting, you know, this yeah. is an interesting theme because I, I, I'm <clears throat> sitting here wondering about uh, students in high school now who yeah. think they wanna, wanna be a teacher mm -hmm. and whether or not they understand the sort of the multiple tracks you could, there, there, are, there are different tracks one could take to ultimately get to where you wanna go. Can I just say, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say this. Please don't make those decisions now. I feel that it's really important to be open to where your path may lead, and especially now, because things are gonna change so much in their worlds between what they think they want. There are jobs out there that, that aren't even invented yet. Um, and I think we limit ourselves when we determine that we know exactly what we want to do or where our, what our goals are. Um, I think we can only begin the journey with what we feel passionate about. And for me, it was teaching and, and students, um, but then being open to opportunities that sometimes can be scary. Right. I mean, moving right. to New Jersey was really scary for our family. Yeah. Um, and we left a lot behind, but there were so many opportunities that we didn't even know about that were in front of us. Could, 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 uh, could, a young, could you argue then that a young person could go and immerse themselves in a journalism or, or another subject area, another area of discipline, and then add the teaching part? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and we have a lot of people that come into teaching after different careers, and they really bring a re richness to teaching when they've had that outside world experience. Yeah, the, op the, the options. I haven't heard it quite, quite put that way, but the, mm -hmm. the track in and, and don't make decisions too early. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure there's enough of that advice given. I, I think that's probably true. I think that's probably true. I think that um, we're very eager to follow a path that feels like it's successful, um, but it has to. I guess the thing I'm reinforcing is that being successful is being true to yourself and being able to, um, I guess, you know, follow your dreams and do what is in your heart because that's, that's gonna lead to success. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty basic stuff, isn't it? Pretty but, basic. but hard to do. 
It's not necessarily easy to, you know, use the word follow your dreams. We hear that a lot. Yep. I, I hear that a lot. And, and people that I talk to do what's, what your, what, right. uh, work towards your passion. But as a, as a high school student, it's, I, I would think that it's tough to get to them on that with that concept. You know what I think is important to remember is that you have to be willing to do the hard work and you have to be willing to do work that you think is maybe you know not good enough. For example, you know working off off as a substitute teacher having just left being you know having my own classroom and uh, of students that I was responsible for. That felt like a big step back for me mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. not being afraid to do that and work hard to get to where you want to get to, I think that's a really important piece of it. Um, so to persevere and to keep a focus on where you think you want to go, but be open to the fact that your path could change, and that's okay too. The, the, the work in the classroom um, seems to be um, much more than just dealing with the 20, 25, however, however many kids in that class. So mm -hmm. it, it seems to be uh, more complicated than that. Uh, issues of student performance and, and uh, all of those kinds of concepts. So when you're, when you're in, in uh, undergraduate school and you want to be a teacher, does anybody focus on that to really, to really get young people to understand that there's more to the teaching profession than just working with kids on a day-to-day -day basis. It seems more complicated, actually. It's very complicated, and we work, um, certainly are working with higher education to try to create a better connection between the program that teachers are, are receiving and the reality of what is needed in the classrooms. And things are changing so rapidly with technology um, and, and with teaching and learning and with the focus on learning it's been happening so rapidly over the past 10 years that it's difficult for teachers to keep up with it. It's difficult for all of us to keep up with it. But we know, and having just gone through last year the public forums around the strategic plan, um, that in order to prepare our students for what lies beyond high school, we have to do things differently. And we have to do things differently from the very beginning. And that's a huge challenge because, as you say, it's very complicated. You're meeting individual needs of students, social, emotional, beyond um, academic uh, needs. It's an absolute reality, though, because if you don't, then you know th nobody's going to be successful. Uh, so it's you're right, Tim. It's very, very complicated. How do you de how do you deal with um, <clears throat> the, the, as a layperson? You read the newspapers, listen to television, listen to the news, and you've got people at the federal level talking about what's, what's right for education. You have people on the state level, and then uh, you have the local community, which I think most of us believe is where the real action uh, takes place and the real leadership ought to come from. But how do you balance all of that? Mm -hmm. So that's the key question. And I believe that the way to balance it is to create layers that filter. So what I want oh, okay. is I want the principals to be able to focus on what matters in the building for the needs of the students. And in order to meet the needs of the students, you have to meet the needs of the teachers, right? So that should be their focus. And I don't want them to be distracted by all of the mandates or worried about, well, what about this that's come? I've heard, I've heard that this is going to be happening. I've heard that I'm going to have to do this. Typically, there is a time. We hear about things that are going to be changing and regulations that are coming or mandates that are coming, but they're not coming tomorrow. So we have another layer of people called central office, and our job is to be able to filter that and to interpret it and to get the appropriate amount of information to the appropriate people at the appropriate times. And we've been doing that this year, and it feels a lot better. It feels a lot less chaotic. Um, we still have a long way to go. We really, we've already been talking as an administrative team about how we really need our focus to be very pointed and sharp so that people know this is what matters, this is what I want to pay attention to, and oh, by the way, we have a professional development plan that's going to help you get there. And uh, that's what we are hearing from teachers. And 
I think that's how you manage it all, by understanding what's number one priority, what matters most to the community in which we serve, and how do we balance it with all of the requirements that are coming to, at us from, from the state. What's the, so here's this complicated <coughs> maze almost, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and you, ha you have a classroom teacher, what's, what's their life like? Uh, you know, you have, you, have, uh, you have classroom guides and you have lesson plans and all of that, all of that stuff, but what's their, what's their work week like? Wow, so it would look diff really different depending on what grade level you were at, uh -huh. and I would never presume to be able to answer that question in the way that a teacher would be able to answer right. that question. Right. Um, but certainly there's a tremendous amount. When you say what's their week like, you know, in terms of planning for lessons, grading papers or tests, um, meeting with parents, meeting with colleagues to plan, um, evaluation that's taking place with people walking randomly into their classrooms and um, feedback all around how they're doing, um, gathering data that we're analyzing on student growth and, and achievement and being required to take that data and translate it into instructional practice. And then, by the way, balancing a personal life with all of that, yeah, right? right? Right. So um, the, the, the pressure is, is intense because because after all, what's the product, right? So the product, product is our children, and they know that, and they take that really seriously. And so what could be more important to the community than their kids and their children? And so we have a precious product, right? and we treat it that way. Yeah. So how do you, as the, as the educational leader in the community, how do you cope with all the, the, the external pressures yeah. The changing in the philosophy, the <clears throat> dynamics, the state, federal level. Yeah. How do you keep pace? So, again, thank you for the question. Because when I find myself getting caught up in a bit of a vicious circle and getting feedback from all around, I take a step back and I don't always do it soon enough but eventually I do. Right, yeah. I take a step back and I ask myself, what is going to have the biggest impact for students? And then I make my decision or my recommendation on that, only on that. Um, now that's after listening to and hearing the input, but as you said, as the educational leader that's been charged to serve the community with that very thing, I feel like sometimes it's only me and my team that has all the information. And so I have to balance it all, but in the end, make a recommendation that I believe, with all of the information I have, is the best for our students. Um, and, and I would only ever make the recommendation if I believed it. I'm not always gonna be right, but I'm always gonna make it based on my belief that it's the best for, for kids. What are the, um, what's the most difficult part of your job? calling snow days <laughs> and that's not a joke that is the most difficult part of my job because i'll always be wrong now you happen to have been <laughs> born in, in uh, uh, north of the border does that you have a it must be a different difficult different experience up uh, in, in canada in yeah. terms of snow days is yeah. that is that true yeah so i had to check in with my my friend about this recently <laughs> and she reminded me that in canada we do not make up snow days one. You don't make them up. It's built into the school year. The school year is not 180 days, it's 193 days. So if you Makes lose sense. four or five days, you don't make no them problem. up, number right. one. Because we all know that making them up after the June 26 doesn't, means nothing educationally. Number two, and this is really important, the equipment is there. We expect it. We, meaning they in Canada, right? You expect to have snow, so children go to school with their boots on and their full snow suits, they do. <laughs> and the, we have the snow, we just have the equipment to be able to manage the expected snowfall so that the number of snow days, even though there could be significant snow, is minimized, but I also then do have to say that we had way more snow here this year, way more than my daughter who lives outside of Toronto. Yeah, 
So it was just unprecedented. You, made, you, you brought it up, so this pro, the, making that decision, yeah. do you sort of have to check around with the other oh, yeah. districts in the right. region? Right, but you know, what, what's become, <laughs> now, that, now that I've been here for two winters, what's become very, very clear to me is that what Holliston is doing next door is kind right. of irrelevant because their weather patterns are different, and most importantly, their roads are different. And they're not required to have sidewalks cleared. It's not an expectation. <laughs> so we're different. We're different communities. Our expectations is in this town is what I have to keep, you know, that's what is primary in my mind. But our reality, you know, one of our, one of the wonderful qualities of our town <laughs> is our lovely winding Absolutely. country roads. So did you study in your, in your uh, graduate program, did you study no. weather, weather <laughs> forecasting? We did or? not. No? We did not study that. It, I'm impressed with the uh, with, uh, wide variety of subject areas that you, you have to have some understanding of. Uh, one is, uh, I get the educational policy stuff, but you live in a, uh, in work in a political environment. How much time is spent uh, in, in your own training uh, in understanding political dynamics, demographics of respective communities? Hmm. So not a lot of direct training in ed leadership program um, because I think it varies by community. I think the more relevant piece of that is an understanding of people dynamics, right? And the understanding of, you know, the kinds of training around active listening and um, communication and the importance of those two things is definitely a part of the training um, because of the leadership position that you're about to take on. And that, that crosses communities and, and um, politics. So you've been here for a couple of years. Almost. What attracted you to Hopkinton and then Really, what, what, what sort of your, your hopes for the community? Right. So first of all, I, I'm very excited about being here. I absolutely love working here. Um, I, I, it's a town that it, it's made up of just really great people, caring people, dedicated people, um, and that, you know, that's the community that includes um, our teachers who don't necessarily live in the community, but many of them do. So first of all, I love being here. Um, but but I, I want to tell you a little story about what attracted me to Hopkinton. So I was an assistant superintendent at the time, not looking. Not, I was finishing my doctorate and was going to wait another year. You know, finish off my third year, finish my right. doctorate, and then start looking. Now I'm ready to become a superintendent. Um, and we hear about superintendent searches, right, because it, it, you get mailings whenever there's going to be one. So Hopkinton came across my desk. and. I thought, oh, I, Hopkinton, that's where the marathon starts. And it, I, I live close to Hopkinton. I was just curious about it. It was interesting. So I started some research. And I started looking carefully. And I looked into the superintendent search that had just yeah. happened and the qualities of what they were looking for in a leader. And that's what spoke to me. I, I thought, well, they're describing me. And I think we belong together. And so I went to the person running the search, Art Betancourt, with NASDAQ. He was at the Summer Institute. And I went up to him and I said, so um, I'm interested in, in becoming the superintendent of Hopkinton. What do I need to do? <laughs> so uh, he did that. He smiled and, and said, you know, come and we'll, we'll come and we'll talk and we'll have a meeting. And it just went from there, I think. And I've said this before in interviews, it's really important, I think, in this role that you choose a community as much as they choose you. So first they have to choose you, but you want to make uh, sure good point. Yep. that you're a good match for them yep. because if you're going to do a good job in this work, you want to be here for a while. You don't, you're not going to do anything worthwhile in, in three years. You're only going to just get it started. And so I wanted to find a community where I felt that I could really belong and that we were, we were connected in terms of what they were looking for and what I felt I had to bring. You know, I think what, what's powerful is, is, um, is the fact that you don't view the short term. I think that's a, that's a really great attitude to have. And you know, at the, the problem with this uh, kind of discussion is it's entirely too short. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to reserve 
uh, the right, and hopefully you'd come back. Um, oh, absolutely. To talk a little bit more in depth. And maybe, maybe we should bring uh, a couple of your principles in and, and, and talk about that as well. But just sort, sort of to wrap this up, mm -hmm. thoughts about the future. I mean, because I know you think about it, so. <clears throat> the comment that I'll make, Tim, in, in closing, is that the future requires change. We cannot mm -hmm. continue to do business as usual and continue to be as successful as we've been. Because the world is changing. The, everything is changing around us. And, I, and I, I want the community to understand that none of those things are taken on without a lot of thought and without, um, without the goal in mind of making things better. So I hope that I've demonstrated that we re that I'm collaborative in my work and that we want to hear from the community. Um, I also want to put out there that as we continue to grow and improve and change and improve, change is going to be required, and that can sometimes be scary. Um, but we'll do it together, and we'll do it carefully, and we'll take we'll take the steps along the way to 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 do it in a way um, that keeps people feeling supported. Well, I think that's the perfect note to end on. Good. There you um, go. And uh, as I said, I th as, as I've said before, we'd like to get you back and talk a little bit more about <clears throat> some of the some to. of the interesting things that's happening in the district. But I think uh, you made a right choice, and I think the community made a right choice. And it's going to be fun to watch uh, the kind of growth and change that needs to take place in the Hopkins and Public Schools under your leadership. So thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Tim. Troop 72969 from Hopkinton. We would like to thank Mr. Trojan for the awesome tour of the H Camp Studio. If you are interested in fun and adventurous field trips, we recommend one, to learn a Girl Scout troop. And two, visiting H Camp to see how local television is created and produced. We also want to give a shout out to Kalala Supermarket to thank Dale for our Girl Scout troop tour. And for always giving us a space to set up our cookie booth. The policeman who caught us on drinking said, try Al-Anon family groups. Are you troubled by someone else's drinking? You might be surprised at what you could learn in an Al-Anon family group from people just like you. Call 1-888-4-ALANON or go to alanon.org.